Welcome to the MD's Fantasy Football Show. Now for your host, Dan Mater. And welcome back, MD Nation, to the show. We only have two more left. Two more left before the week one preview shows. Before fantasy football matters again. Before we're back to playing head-to-head matchups, where we're sitting there on the couch awaiting every snap, every play could be possible points for our fantasy team. It is such an exciting time. It is so close. As always, I'm your host, Dan Mater, and I am bringing you a great episode here today. We're going to be talking about the rest of my running back rankings, especially some of the top guys that we didn't get to talk about in the 5 Best, 5 Bus, and 5 Sleepers episode. We're going to be talking about a live mock draft that we're going to be doing live on the show today. It's going to be a half-point PPR from a six-seed, or a six-pick, I should say, spot as we do that live on the air. And we're also going to be doing a mailbag segment at the end of the show, of course, because every Everyone has a ton of questions they must get in now that we are primetime draft season. This is it. This is the week. After after week three of the preseason is over, this is the time where almost everyone is going to be drafting all week long. So this, of course, is primetime questions. I'm getting to them on social media. I'm getting to them in the show. I am getting back to you. I'm giving you the best advice you can possibly receive. I promise you that. And if you want to get your questions answered by me or on the show, make sure you tweet at me at MDSFF Show or on Facebook at MDFF Show. Or go to the website, www.mdffshow.com, and you can click the Contact Us button, and you can send me a direct email. I'm going to get back to you, I promise you, one way or another, and may even put your question on the show, like some of the ones that I selected for tonight. And of course, make sure you're following Twitter, make sure you have the notifications on, as I am doing the player update news notifications, and if last night was any indication... We have quite a bit of news that was good to know right away, especially I know some people who were drafting as last night was happening, and there are two big-time players that really changed a lot of draft boards as a result. So if you were following this show, you got that news right away, and you did not make the mistakes. Hopefully, hopefully it was early enough for you to not make those mistakes that are now crippling some fantasy teams that just started, just got their drafts in last night. It's a crazy situation, and we're going to talk about that in the latest news segment. Now remember, this is the second to last show before we go into the week one preview, before we go into the season schedule. For week one, obviously it's going to be a little bit different than it will be for the rest of the year. Week one is just going to be two episodes, Thursday and Friday. We're doing the two preview episodes because at the end of the day, Monday, there's nothing to recap, obviously. And then Tuesday, there's no waiver wire, waiver wire players to go over at that point. You know, everyone's just drafted. There's really not, unless there's some major injuries, there's not going to be too many guys looking to even play the waiver wire going into week one. So we're just going to come back on Thursday and Friday with our two preview episodes, preview part one and part two, where we'll preview part one, we'll preview the Thursday night, the one o'clock games. Part two on Friday, we'll preview the four o'clock Sunday night and Monday night games. And of course, have the injury updates for you leading into those weeks. And I'll also have, because starting this year, it's a brand new thing that this show is doing we are doing week-to-week projections and rankings available for you to help you even more in trying to win your leagues this year so as a new element that we've added that will be on the website every single week you'll be able to go there to the md fantasy football show at at mdffshow.com and be able to look at projections and rankings to try to help with your start sit headaches and of course In those episodes, we're going to have mailbag segments. So if you have questions and you're still not sure, even after looking at the rankings, exactly what you want to do, what your gut is telling you, that's what I'm here for. And make sure you ask those questions. And I may even put a few of those on the show as we'll have mailbag segments in those episodes as well. So all that's going to be available to you. That's what's coming up for the MD's Fantasy Football Show. Now remember, week two... We'll have four episodes. We'll have one on Monday, which will recap the Sunday games. And we'll have one on Tuesday, which will recap the Monday night game and have a waiver wire segment for you. Wednesday's the only day there's no podcast because on Wednesday, I'm working on the projections and the rankings for the following week. 
So that's what's going to be going on. That's what you have to look forward to with the MD's Finney's Football Show. I hope you guys keep enjoying it. I've been fired up. I've been having a great time recording. We're getting a much bigger following now because of UMD Nation. People are starting to hear about the MD's Finney's Football Show and how it can help them win their championships. And that has all to do with UMD Nation, and I greatly appreciate it. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this episode, get to the latest news, which is a big one today. So let's drop that sounder and get started. Latest news. So let's kick today's latest news segment off, starting with the Lamar Miller news of him tearing his ACL. It did come back. Uh, this is Sunday night. I'm recording this, so you guys have this on Monday. It came back earlier on Sunday afternoon. The MRI confirmed that it is, in fact, a torn ACL and will be out for the year. So that Duke Johnson trade looking better and better for the Texans now after that. Duke Johnson comes in. As of now, he would be the workhorse. Now, are they expected to bring somebody in? Yeah. They're expected to wait to see who gets cut because there's going to be a lot of cuts made this week. And just after this weekend is over, once the week preseason four is over, uh, there's going to be a lot of cuts then and leading up to. And they're going to see what their options are once that takes place. I don't expect Duke Johnson to have this entire backfield to himself by the time the year starts. I expect him to pick somebody up who becomes available, who has been a proven veteran runner for them, uh, or at least in the league. And that's what I would expect to have happen. I will tell you, no matter who they pick up, I would expect Duke Johnson to be the heavily involved running back when it comes to the passing game with Lamar Miller in there because he had a little bit of a pass catching ability to him as well as being a good workhorse for them I kind of had to split as far as the catching receiving work goes for him about 50 50 now with him gone and my expectation to be if they were to bring in another running back that it would be somebody who's a little bit more of a change of pace back to Duke Johnson someone's a little bit bigger maybe better at the goal line maybe a little bit better on first and second downs that type of runner i expect duke johnson to get 70 to 80% of the passing down work from the running back position with the Houston Texans so i do think this is a guy now all of a sudden where we could be looking from a couple of years ago when duke johnson was very very valuable in PPR leagues, half point or one point, doesn't matter, and he could be very valuable in those again. I have him projected for about 60 receptions, and my projections are up to date. I do include you know, the Lamar Miller injury. I do re- include the Andrew Luck, Andrew Luck retirement that we're going to get into in a second. Those things are included in there. All the numbers for all the players that would be affected by those injuries and that, that surprising retirement news is is all in there. It's all, all accounted for. So when you go to the MD's Fantasy Football Show website, you're going to see everything that I have changed so far. Now that, of course, is going to get tweaked again if more moves happen, and I suspect that more moves will. But Duke Johnson has a real opportunity here to show why he was a highly talented talented back coming out of the draft a few years ago, why he's been somebody that a lot of people really like from a talent standpoint and always thought he had a raw deal and should, if he ever got the chance for the opportunity, would be able to show what he can truly do in the NFL. This is his chance. This is his moment. Can you truly be a three-down back? Can you be someone who is a playmaker, who you can go to on first and second downs? Are you somebody an offense can lean on? Are you more than just a pass-catching back? That is going to be the questions that are going to need to be answered. This is the year where he'll have an opportunity to do so. As a result, right now, Duke Johnson got catapulted pretty high in my rankings. And we're going to get into that in the first segment when we talk about my running back rankings that weren't talked that were outside of the five best five bus five sleepers uh, episode. When we get to talk about other guys, we're going to talk about where he is. But this is a real opportunity for Duke Johnson. He is somebody who, right now, I will tell you right off the bat, should be getting valued around the fifth, sixth round, especially if you're in a PPR league. He is in the territory of the Philip Lindsay's, of the Chris Carsons, right off the bat because of this opportunity. Now, of course, in the other piece of news that we have to talk about is Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck retiring, that has to be the most shocking, surprising, unexpected, unheard of piece of news that came out of last night. And unless you live under a rock over the past 48 hours, there's no way you hadn't heard about it because even CNN was breaking Andrew Luck news that he retired. Everybody knows Andrew Luck retired. 
that affects so many things when it comes to the Colts. Mostly negatively, but there is a couple players that it affects positively. Or I shouldn't say a couple, but one in particular, and that's Marlon Mack. This is a team two years ago when Andrew Luck did not play. They ran the ball more than they had in the past five years. Frank Reich isn't afraid to run the football if he has to come from the Philadelphia system. They've always been able to have an effective running game, even though they want to be pass first. I do like Jacoby Brissett, but he's not Andrew Luck. So I do expect them to lean on the run a little bit more than they would have originally. Now remember, with Marlon Mack and my projections that I have him for, I only have him projected for 14 games. I don't have him projected for a full 16-game season for obvious reasons. He hasn't done it yet. And we'll see if he can. There's always that possibility. But he is a guy who does seem to struggle from soft tissue injuries from time to time. So I have him for 14 games. But I have him now getting over 1,000 yards and 8 touchdowns in just 14 games. So if he was to play 16 games, we're looking at somebody who could be easily going over 1,200 yards and possibly double digit touchdowns this season. Because I just expect him to lean on the run a little bit more. Naeem Hines will still be involved in the passing game, but his overall targets and his, well, not his work share, but his overall targets and receptions and yards uh, from the passing game standpoint, which is where he was pretty valuable at, I would expect to come down a little bit. Just a little bit. All the pass catchers, I expect to come down a bit with Jacoby Brissett. I like Jacoby Brissett. I think he has a decent talent. I think he has a decent opportunity to show that he can be a starting NFL quarterback in this league. I do think he has that capability to do so. And I do think he's in one of the best situations he could possibly be in to be able to prove that, to be able to succeed in that. He has a great offensive-minded coach in Frank Reich. He has good offensive weapons all around him. He has a pretty, was probably the best offensive line the Colts have had in years this season. So he has all the elements that he needs to be able to show that he can succeed and be the starter for them moving forward. And they're going to need to see because he can be a free agent next year. So the Colts are going to have this season to decide if Jacoby Brissett is going to be the future of this organization or not. And he has a chance to show why he should get paid NFL starter money right away. So this is a big opportunity for everybody involved, but he's not Andrew Luck. He's not. There's going to be some growing pains here. Remember, as far as he's play, he played one full season and he was okay. He wasn't great, wasn't bad, but he was okay. Guys like T.Y. Hilton, though, they were way lower than they normally were for fantasy purposes in that year. Part of that was due to T.Y. Hilton was banged up. He missed four games, was bent, was also injured while playing for quite a few of them afterwards. But he had one of the worst years ever for fantasy purposes that season. Now all of a sudden you have guys like Jack Doyle and Eric Ebron who also take hits. Because just in general, the Colts not throwing as much. It's also Jacoby Brissett isn't as great down the field, isn't as accurate, isn't going to have as many good plays. I have him for somewhere around 3,700 yards, 25 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, which would be a very solid season for Jacoby Brissett and probably would get him a contract from the Colts thinking that he would progress and be able to develop even more moving forward. That would be a successful season for Jacoby Brissett, but we're talking about fantasy football. For fantasy football, that leaves a lot to be desired when you're looking at guys like T.Y. Hilton, when you're looking at guys like Jack Doyle and Eric Ebron. And if you were somebody who thought Paris Campbell could break out in his rookie season, this affects him as well. Devin Funches is no longer a guy who can be considered a possible sleeper as a touchdown threat. None. Devin Funches goes undrafted for me. T.Y. Hilton, I'm not taking him before the fourth round. Maybe not even before the fifth, because his numbers that I have projected at are less than 1,000 yards now, about five touchdowns. That puts him in wide receiver two category, and because he's T.Y. Hilton, he has upside. But that's truly what you're looking at. That is a reasonable expectation now with Jacoby Brissett instead of Andrew Luck. That is a big difference. I mean, from the position overall, we're talking about 1,000 less yards and 10 less touchdowns just from the drop from Andrew Luck to Jacoby Brissett, which affects everybody. So that's what I have going on there. Make sure you check out the rest of my rankings. I, we got to wrap this up and get going here and get into the next segment. But you know, the latest news, it's only about two players, but it's dominant. It really affected a lot of different things last night in that week three preseason matchup, which is always why you should draft after week three, because that's when you know these guys are going to get the playing time when they could possibly have the most chance to get hurt. Andrew Luck's case, no one could have seen that coming, but it's not any different than a Lamar Miller getting blowing out his ACL or any other player blowing out his ACL at that point. 
it was just more shocking because he retired at the age of 29. All right, so that's going to wrap that up. Let's hit this, hit the uh, break right here. Come back on the other side. We're talking about some more running back ranks for me. A little more exploration, a little more examination on that end so you guys have a full picture of who you should be going after in your drafts this week. Tired of spending hours upon hours on research for your drafts but still want the excitement of having something on the line while watching the game? Well, join the Thrive Fantasy app where they have streamlined the process for you to make it easy and fun to play along. Use promo code MDFF when you sign up with a $10 deposit and receive an additional $10 for free. Again, that's promo code MDFF. All right, so for the deeper dive of the running back rankings, I just want to talk about a few guys here before we move over to the live mock draft that I didn't get a chance to really talk about because maybe I have them ranked close to their ADP or maybe they weren't you know, different enough to be a bust or be a sleeper or what have you. So I just want to talk about a few of those guys here uh, to kind of give you a feel for what are some other names to be looking out for regardless of what the round is. And... You know, with the resume, I gave you my top five and everything, you know, Kamara and McCaffrey and Barkley and Zeke and Todd Gurley. And, you know, it's good to see that Zeke should be signing that contract soon. I know nothing official has actually been signed at this point, but it is very much expected that he will be back for week one. And I think you can take that with some confidence as you're going into your drafts this week for sure. Take him in your top four. Don't be afraid to do so. I've stayed vigilant on Todd Gurley still being my number five guy because I fully expect him to light it up the way he has been. I don't expect him to have this significant share drop that a lot of people are expecting to have. While I do have him for 10% less of the workload, and yet that would still put him as the number one running back on a points-per-game basis on my projections, and that's based off of 14 games and him missing even two games this season. So I've stayed vigilant on Todd Gurley. The one I'm still... A little bit hesitant on right now is that I do have David Johnson ranked six at this moment. I've looked at tweaking some of those numbers, but at the end of the day, I do think there's a decent chance he should be right about there. Look, we know David Johnson, what the player he is. I think at the end of the day, what saves him, especially if you're talking PPR leagues, is that he's going to catch the ball. Now, after watching the preseason games, I don't know how you can come back impressed at all with the Arizona Cardinals offense thus far, especially the offensive line when it comes to trying to run David Johnson at the moment. But you know he's going to catch the ball. You know he's going to be an all-purpose back, which always gives him a very high floor. And when you're talking in PPR leagues, you're talking about a guy who has a very likely scenario, especially given the rest of the pass catchers on that team, to average around seven targets or more a game, which should put him around four to five receptions a game, quite possibly on on a per-game basis on an average game to game. So if that's going to wind up being the case, you're talking about a guy, especially in PPR leagues, who's going to have a huge floor for you, which is why he winds up being number six. He could still wind up having a pretty good season statistically. I don't know if it's going to be a very efficient season because my worries about that offensive line, because I don't think they're going to have a lot of holes for him. But his talent and his volume at the end of the day should see him be an RB1. And I do expect him to have a better year than he did last year because almost anything would be better than last season. So just natural progression from the bottom up. And that that's what's going to happen right there with David Johnson. So while it still might not be the prolific season that it was two years ago or three years ago now, actually, excuse me, because he was injured two years ago. While it may not be on that level with that kind of efficiency, it still should put him squarely as an RB1 with the potential to get up to that level because he has that capability as a player. But it should give him the floor of an RB1 given the volume and everything else going on with him. That argument also it pretty much comes over to my next player, which is Le'Veon Bell at number 7. It's the same deal here. Le'Veon Bell, I don't love his offensive line. I don't really love the offensive round him. You guys know I despise Adam Gase. I don't need to get into that more because I hate him. I feel like every show I feel a reason to dump on Adam Gase and probably will throughout the season as well. But with Le'Veon Bell, it's volume. I'm not buying. I know that there's a news alert that came out that said Ty Montgomery might share some work with Le'Veon Bell. Throw that out the window. That's not going to wind up being the case while Le'Veon Bell shakes off some rust. I, no. 
Le'Veon Bell is hands down the best player on that team. Not just the best player on the offense. The best player on that team. They are not going to be sharing the workload with Ty Montgomery. And if they do, Adam Gase needs to be fired immediately. I know that wouldn't happen, but Adam Gates would need to be fired immediately. If you actually find a reason to take Le'Veon Bell off the field after his what he's been paid, after the and what kind of player that he is compared to the rest of your ball club, you have to be fired because you cannot sit there after what you did to Kenyon Drake. You cannot come back and do the same thing to a caliber of Le'Veon Bell who's been established as a top running back in this league. That cannot happen. That cannot be allowed to happen. You cannot have him riding pine for absolutely no reason like you did with Kenyon Drake. So with that in mind, I do not buy into the idea that somehow Ty Montgomery and Le'Veon Bell are actually going to be splitting any kind of a workload in any significant way. So the volume here, and because he's also a dual threat as a pass catcher and a very good runner, similar to David Johnson, it gives him a high floor. I expect him to finish as an RB1 as well. The guy I really want to talk about here is Nick Chubb a little bit. I put him inside of my top 10. He was not inside my top 10 until after they traded away Duke Johnson. He wasn't that far outside. We're talking the low teens here. But he is number 9 now on my board for the most part, depending on your scoring format. But his general for me is number 9 right inside that top 10. He's going to be the workhorse for at least the first 9 weeks. Or 10 week, nine games, I would say, because they have a buy in between Kareem Hunt's suspension. So that's going to put him at about nine games with that extra week of Kareem Hunt working his way back into the offense before I think he has a chance to have any kind of significant role. So we have Nick Chubb, who is already proven to have the talent and be able to be an RB1 because that's what exactly what he was. Every game that he started last season with the Cleveland Browns was an RB1. So we know he's going to be that, and now he's going to be a undisputed workhorse. He's going to be there for passing down work along with we all, what we already know is a great rusher. And I believe he showed enough last year to show you that he can be a very effective pass catcher as well and catch people off guard in that sense because they're not looking for him to beat them in the wheel routes, to beat them in the flat consistently. And he can do that, and he will now be put in position to do that. So I like Nick Chubb a lot. I have him inside the top 10. I'm not going to worry about Kareem Hunt later on. A, you got to get to the playoffs first of all. But second of all, That's why I have him a little bit lower because, honestly, if it wasn't for Kareem Hunt, Nick Chubb would probably be my number six running back overall. So he already is a few spots lower because of Kareem Hunt because he might lose somewhat of a share come playoff time. But even then, even then, he will still be a high-end RB2 with RB1 upside at worst, at worst. Because like I said before, the worst-case scenario is that him and Kareem Hunt are on a 50-50 split. That's the worst case scenario, which means Nick Chubb would still be an RB2 even in that scenario. And that would be the worst case. So I I super expect him to be an RB1 throughout the season. Maybe he's a lower end, higher end RB2 when Kareem Hunt comes back. But he's still going to be a guy who's going to be on a lot of playoff teams and will be able to help your team win at the end of the day. So I'm not going to shy away from taking Nick Chubb there. Next guy I kind of want to talk about a little bit is Joe Mixon because Joe Mixon has been falling in most platforms. I have stayed pretty vigilant on the fact that I have him as my number 10 guy. It's still an offense that's going to feature him, I believe so, as a workhorse back. Yes, Giovanni Bernard is there. I think there's going to be a lot of Giovanni Bernard playing with Joe Mixon with this season, especially given the woes that they've had at the wide receiver position. John Ross just came back to practice today. A.J. Green still expected to miss possibly the first month of the season, so that leaves him with John Ross and Tyler Boyd and Alex Erickson at the moment. I expect Giovanni Bernard to help them out in the passing game, not necessarily just as the running back in the backfield, but lined up with Joe Mixon or lined up on the outside as a slot guy. So I don't think it's going to take away from Joe Mixon. I don't don't think he's going to lose passing down work in a significant way. And while I don't love the offensive line, I do like the way Zach Taylor is going to come in there with a game plan to be able to utilize Joe Mixon. And as a guy who's going to be a dual threat, which is big for running backs in their floors, if you have not been able to figure that out by now, as I've talked through it already with David Johnson and Le'Veon Bell, it's going to be it's going to give him a big plus. And the difference I have between him and Dalvin Cook, which I have Dalvin Cook number 11, and the only reason why I have him a little bit higher is cuz I trust Joe Mixon to finish out the season 
or at least play more games more so than I do Dalvin Cook for obvious reasons. I think as far as if they played 16 games, given the offense, given their capabilities, Dalvin Cook may outperform Joe Mixon at the end of the year if he was actually to play full 16, if they were actually to play the same amount of games. But there's just more to be confident about with Joe Mixon when it comes to being able to last throughout the entire season. And he's had his some of his concerns so far early on in his career as well. But he's built more like a guy who you would suspect should be able to take more of a beating. And he's going to have to to some degree. But he's going to be the offensive piece without A.J. Green in there. The offense is going to have to entirely run through him. And even when A.J. Green comes back, it's still going to be him and A.J. Green who the offense runs through before everybody else. So I do like Joe Mixon still as my number 10 running back. Dalvin Cook, obviously I love him. I talked to him a little bit about there. But sky's the limit for this guy if he can actually stay on the field. We got to see him break a big run yesterday's game. He has the, or Saturday's game, excuse me. He has the explosive ability. We've always known that. he This system fits him perfectly. The way the zone scheme sets up. The way he can be utilized in the passing game. I've said it before. I believe he is a faster Arian Foster. The only question is, can he overcome his injuries the way Arian Foster never was able to do it's going to be the same system going to be utilized in similar ways and he's even more explosive than foster was and that is why i love dalvin cook and why sky's the limit truly for him if he can stay on the field some other guys I want to talk about i've talked about mark ingram enough to you guys i think this season to let you know that he is my number one sleeper for you guys i do think he's going to finish this year as an rb1 i think he has every opportunity to do so So one other guy I want to talk to you guys about before we move on is Damian Williams. I talked about Damian Williams before, but I have to cool it on Damian Williams a little bit. He is still a guy who I would take lower than his ADP, but he is not quite the bust that I was making him out to be uh, originally. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that suddenly Carlos Hyde looks like he very well may not be on this roster after all, which I think is a huge mistake because I think Darwin Thompson is too similar to Damian Williams. I don't know where their, their goal line, their short yardage, their just pure first and second down runner is going to come from unless they, Andy Reid just doesn't plan on using one. He just plans on being shotgun in every play this season. Maybe that is the case because of Patrick Mahomes. Uh, it's shaping up to be that way, in my opinion, if you're going to go Damian Williams and Darwin Thompson as your top two backs. But with Carlos Hyde truly looking like he may not make this team unless something significant changes within the Kansas City Chiefs camp, Damian Williams is not in as much danger of losing his job, his role as the main starter as I previously thought. Look, the biggest thing I hate about Damian Williams was that he doesn't have a long example size of him being a successful runner between the tackles. We know he's a good pass catcher. We know he always has been. But as a a successful runner between the tackles, he does not have a big sample size for that. Last year was his only sample size for that. And I feel like, and I still do, that Carlos Hyde is better in those situations. But if Carlos Hyde's not even going to be on the team, and the backup to him is going to be Darwin Thompson, who's pretty much a clone of Damian Williams... Well, then that concern that Damian Williams may lose out in the in that scenario on those carries at some point because I don't think he's as, as efficient of a runner goes away. That's a big thing. That's a big thing for Damian Williams. So I would take him a lot higher than I was previously ranking him and previously telling you guys him to take. I still take him a little bit lower than his ADP because his ADP still has him at 12. I still don't think he's an RB1, but... He is going to probably be a solid RB2 with RB1 capabilities from week to week because of the offense. So that is somebody I wanted to talk about because I have harped on him quite a bit. And I guess one more name that I'll throw out there real quick because people are wondering about this is Melvin Gordon. I have ranked I have Melvin Gordon ranked as my 14th running back overall. Uh I still lean towards him getting done by week one or at least around week two. I don't think he's going to miss a ton of games is my point. He's not a Le'Veon Bell situation. It's not a situation where he can come back in the second half of the season. It's not going to take that long. I think at most it would be the first month of the season at most. But I said this in another podcast actually that I was on earlier this week. The Chargers are a Super Bowl aspiring team. Those aspirations disappear if they cannot get Melvin Gordon onto the team activated and playing for them on Sundays. So that's why I think at the end of the day, this deal will find a way to get done and be compromised on. And maybe maybe it will take week one 
of seeing Austin Eckler and Justin Jackson out there again and just realizing while they can hold the fort, in a matter of speaking, they are not what you need to put you over the top. They are not going to make you special. They are not going to give you that extra gear. Melvin Gordon can only do that. So I figured I would mention him. I do him 14th overall. I am perfectly fine with you still taking him in the third round. I have not wavered on that one bit. So that's just some of my rankings. Obviously, to check out all of my rankings for my standard, my half point, and my one point PPR leagues, Go to the website, mdffshow.com, so you can look at all the projections, all the rankings, all the numbers that I have for them laid out for you as you get ready for your drafts. Remember, when you go to that website, the bottom left corner, you can click, I have the download button available for you guys, so you can put it on your devices and take it with you to your drafts, so just keep that in mind as well. We're going to hit the break. On the other side, we're going to do a half-point PPR draft from the sixth pick. And we're going to go through using the MD's Fantasy Football Show rankings to give you guys a feel for what kind of team you can have in that scenario using the rankings of the show. So let's take a quick break and get right into the live mock draft here. The MD's Fantasy Football Show is proud to become the newest member of the Belly Up Sports Network. The Belly Up Sports Network is a rising star in the sports industry. After having emerged onto the scene in just a year, they have accrued a massive following with bold articles, standout podcasts, and great debate amongst followers in the forums. Sign up for their newsletter and get access to all of the information throughout the Belly Up Sports Network. Go to bellyupsports.com today to join. Be bold and stand out. So here we are, and it's time to kick off this draft, this Half point PPR live mock draft using the MD's fantasy football show rankings to show you guys what kind of team you could be looking at by using my rankings for your leagues this year and how it could definitely help you win your championships. And instead of just telling you that, I figure by doing these live mock drafts, I can show you. We're going to do one more, of course, on Thursday's episode. We'll be doing the one-point PPR live mock draft during that episode then. So we did that. We already did the standard mock draft from the third pick last episode. This one is from the sixth pick. And these are all 12-team leagues too, by the way. And then tonight, Six pick on Thursday. We're going to do it from the ninth pick. So you kind of see it from beginning of the beginning of the picks, middle towards the end. In some awkward places, like a ninth pick, is an awkward place. So you can actually see, you know, from that situation, how does the MD's fantasy football show rankings hold up? What kind of team can you look at by doing that? That's what this all is about. And now we're going to get this thing started off. Six pick. Here we go, right up on the board to be expected. You know, all the running backs went with the first five picks here that you would expect to see go. And what we have now is we're looking at, oh, guys like DeAndre Hopkins. We're looking at Devontae Adams. We're looking at Julio Jones. We're looking at we're looking at James Conner, Nick Chubb. So who do we go with? Well, the MD's Fantasy Football Show in this scenario does have the – does have Devontae Adams ranked the highest right here. He is the number one wide receiver that we have ranked in all the scoring formats. And in this scenario, the half-point PPR, I do like him more than the other running backs available here, more than Nick Chubb, more than James Conner. So we're actually going to go ahead and we're going to take Devontae Adams with our first-round pick here with the sixth pick overall. Coming back around, waiting, getting back to the mid area of the second round and we come back around and what's on the board we're looking at receivers again surprisingly we're looking at guys like Tyreek Hill Mike Evans George Kittle Antonio Brown these are all names available here now we go on we do have carry on Johnson ranked a little bit higher than most but this is a scenario where you could actually wind up with the top five two of the top five receivers from the MD's Finney's football show because while Devontae Adams is ranked number one, Tyreek Hill we have inside the top five, have him at number three just ahead of Julio Jones for the wide receivers, and we're looking at Tyreek Hill right here. So now all of a sudden we're left in a situation where just going based off of best value, highest rank with the first two rounds, which is really what you want to do, we're going to go ahead and take Tyreek Hill, and I feel really good about that. Now we start off our drafts, we have Devontae Adams, and we have Tyreek Hill. That's a great start. That's two wide receiver ones, two guys who can finish within the top five at their position right off the bat. That is value you can't necessarily get at the running back position all the time. So now we come back in the third round. So we're not looking 
to actually do a no running back strategy here. This this whole time when we go into this draft, we're looking to do what is the most valuable based off of the rankings. And whatever that winds up being, that's what we go with. So sometimes it might lead us down a no running back strategy path. But at the end of the day, really all it is is it's giving you the opportunity to go with the flow on draft day go with where the value is go with the best roster construction overall don't worry about trying to emphasize one strategy or another the best thing you can do it today is go with the most value now i said that to set this up because the most value here coming in is going to be Antonio Brown because we're, we're looking at right now come back in the third round we're midway through we have Antonio Brown and then really close next to him we have guys like Carrion Johnson and Leonard Fournette so if we really want to take a running back here we felt like hey we had two receivers but you know what we really got to come back we got to take a running back here even though I have Antonio Brown on the board and I have ranked a little bit higher that's what you would go with in that situation and I love Carrion Johnson and Leonard Fournette but because we already have Devontae Adams and Tyree Kill I actually going to stick to the rankings and go Antonio Brown here. With Carrion Johnson and Leonard Fournette, there's a good chance in the fourth round one of those guys or Devontae Freeman or Mark Ingram will be available, which I have them all in similar territory of each other. So if one of them is going to be my RB1, I'd rather wait until the fourth round, take Antonio Brown, have three elite receivers, and be dominant in that position and get a guy to be my RB1 who is going to have similar production to somebody who I would take here in the third round anyway. Because once we get past the third round, there's good chances like Amari Cooper, Antonio Brown are going to be gone. Keenan Allen are going to be gone. And then we're going to talk about the next tier of receivers down, which leads off with Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs. But we can stay in the same elite tier, top three tiers, and take Antonio Brown here. Now, I know a lot of you think a lot of people are scared of Antonio Brown this season. All I have to keep saying is that he's going to be the number one featured guy. They're going to pepper him with a ton of targets they can't afford not to. Antonio Brown's going, while he might not have the 15 to 17 touchdowns he's been getting with the Pittsburgh Steelers, he is somebody I still expect to have well over 1,200 yards and still have well over double-digit touchdowns. That's going to be, as your wide receiver three in this situation, that's going to be awesome. And remember, we're, the format that we're playing with right now is a quarterback two running backs, two receivers, a tight end, defense kicker, and a flex spot along with seven bench spots. A standard, pretty much across the board type of format for most leagues. You know, I know some have three receivers. Those are all custom. The, the standard for industry across every board, across ESPN, NFL Network, uh, Yahoo, CBS, you name it, the standard is that two running backs, two receivers, and the flex spot with the tight end along with the quarterback defense and kicker with seven bench spots. So that's what we're basing this off of. So in this case, we would have Devontae Adams, our number one receiver, Tyreek Hill, our number two receiver, and then Antonio Brown would be our flex in this situation. I like that a lot. So that's who we take in the third round as I line that all up for you as to why. And that's what this is all about. I want you to explain, I'm explaining my picks to you and how, what the line of thinking is when you're looking and using my rankings here. So we're back in the fourth round. Of course, the top guy on the board is Kenny Galladay. We're not going to go for a fourth receiver here. You know, this has already turned into almost a zero running back situation and it didn't, didn't really mean to be. So we're looking at the top running backs by far on my board, it's Mark Ingram. Now, behind Mark Ingram, in case you're wondering if you're not, maybe you're personally not a big Mark Ingram fan, and you won't you won't use my rankings in that sense where you you won't agree to that. Josh Jacobs, I have ranked pretty high. He's right there. Sony Michelle has been climbing up my board. He's right there in the fourth round. All of these guys are lower end are well are higher in RB twos with lower end RB one upside. Now, for me personally, because of all the reasons I've laid out for you guys all summer long, Mark Ingram is someone to me who I think is going to be an RB one and a solid RB one at that. Now, I don't think he has potential to be the top five guy, but I do think he's going to be well within that top ten and have potential to compete with any of the elite RB ones up there on a week to week basis. So we're taking Mark Ingram with our fourth round pick, and I feel fantastic. I feel like I just got an RB1 in the fourth round with three wide receiver ones all ready to kick off this team. You're off to a great, great start using these set of rankings. We come back in the fifth round. Now, I am higher on quarterbacks than most. Now, while I'm I'm not so high that I would take a quarterback in the first three rounds because Patrick Mahomes, who's my number one quarterback, I have him rated closer towards that fourth round territory. And that's about as high as I would go on quarterback. But 
After that, I'm not afraid to take quarterbacks in the 5th, the 6th, the 7th round. I'm not trying to wait always to the 12th round to take a quarterback. I like to get elite guys at elite positions whenever possible. And of course, yes, I am setting you up for a reason here. Both Deshaun Watson and Aaron Rodgers are the highest guys on my board at this point. Both are sitting right there in front of me. Now, between the two, I have Aaron Rodgers ranked just in front of Deshaun Watson. And the reason for that is is just accomplishment. I think Aaron Rodgers is due for a big bounce back season. I think he's going to come in with a chip on his shoulder. I think the weapons for Green Bay have improved. And while I love Deshaun Watson too, and for obvious reasons, because he's a dual threat and everything else, and I think these guys are going to be very, very close. I personally just have more trust in Aaron Rodgers on a week-to-week basis when he's playing his A game, which is what I expect from him this season, than I do Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson is still a little bit of a roller coaster, and some of that has to do with the fact that you can only count on DeAndre Hopkins to be healthy any given week. But he has been more of a roller coaster throughout his career so far. Aaron Rodgers, when you know he's playing one of his better seasons, he is consistently going to get you about 20 points or more each every week, which is always going to put you in a great position to win, especially when you have a really good team built around that. I know we could look to try to go and get another running back here and solidify that, but we're looking at Duke Johnson, Philip Lindsay types. I'd rather wait here because there's guys that I think are going to be available in the sixth round that are going to be just as good, and let's wait to see and find out, and we can go through who that is. So we're actually going to go ahead in the fifth round. We're going to take Aaron Rodgers right here. And we're ready to come back. We're seeing who comes off the board. Deshaun Watson actually went right away there. Now, the guy I really wanted to get for us coming back in the sixth round was Tevin Coleman. Tevin Coleman went in the fifth round. Now, while that is disappointing, that is something worth pointing out. Tevin Coleman is somebody who has been going higher and higher. He started off this summer as somebody you could get in the seventh, eighth round. Was a perfect RB4 or RB3 that you could get in a, in a mid part of the draft and that would really help and benefit your team now he's somebody who's creeping closer to that mid to high level rb2 territory closer to the chris carson's the sony michelle's of the philip Lindsay's of the world especially now that lamar miller is hurt you're going to see him creep up a little bit too because it kind of had been those two hanging each other back in the seventh sixth seventh and eighth rounds so that's something important to point out even though it is definitely disappointing but now we're back here in the sixth round And we're looking down the barrel of a guy like Duke Johnson. And we're going to take Duke Johnson. Like I said to you before, I had moved him up into this territory where I'm good with taking him in the sixth round, especially in PPR leagues. And being that this is a half-point PPR league, I think he is a guy who has a good floor, if nothing else, in this situation to be an RB2, a money ball playing RB2 here. So we are going to take Duke Johnson in the sixth round, sticking with the MD's Fantasy Football Show rankings because that's about where I had him right there. I actually have him a little bit of head of guys like Kenyon Drake and Tevin Coleman and Philip Lindsay in half-point PPR leagues just to give you some ideas to where I have him at. So now we're back in the sixth round. So now we have our quarterback. We have three wide receivers. We have two running backs that we feel pretty good about. So as far as starting goes, all we need is a tight end. But those tight ends that I have in the tier in this range are gone. Hunter Henry was the last of that second tier that I have in that sixth, that fifth, sixth, seventh round, which is Evan Ingram, OJ Howard, Hunter Henry. They've all gone. So I'm going to wait on tight end in this situation. And now because we have a pretty much balanced out team, we have a solidified our RB2. We can kind of go back to taking whatever we want at this point. We don't have to avoid the wide receiver position in order to try to accrue more running back depth, especially if we don't have a running back in this scenario that's ranked as high as the receivers. And the guy I'm leading up to at this point is A.J. Green. If you already have a scenario where you have Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill, and Antonio Brown, you have nothing to lose and everything in the world to gain by taking a guy like A.J. Green. We know he's a wide receiver one when he's on the field, and we know we're going to be worried about his injuries. We know we have to wait until September. But if you're already strong at the receiver position and A.J. Green could be your fourth receiver coming off, you have nothing to lose and everything in the world to gain to be absolutely stout at that position. So we're going to go ahead and take A.J. Green and know that in this format with this lineup, 
we're not going to have to worry about receiver again until the late rounds. So now we're going to be looking for value at the running back position. We're looking for value at the tight end position, and we can load up there because we're going to probably we're going to definitely come back and take a fifth receiver. But because there's so many receivers from here out later on that are valuable, we're going to we're going to be able to wait and wait with confidence now with this receiving core that we have just been able to lock up. So before I start the eighth round and finish out this live mock draft, I'm going to take a quick break right here. Come back on the other side with the last eight rounds for you. The MD's Fantasy Football Show is now partnered with the Unwrapped Sports Network. Unwrapped Sports Network has a top-notch sports blog covering all sports all the time with a team of talented writers. You can also visit their podcast page to listen to this show and several others covering multiple sports. Sign up for their newsletter and never miss a thing at UnwrappedSports.com. Again, that's UnwrappedSports.com. So now we're back in the eighth round. We are solidified the wide receiver position. We still need a starting tight end at some point. You know, we'll take the defensive kicker in the later rounds. We still need to get some depth at the running back position too. Now, on the cheat sheet of the app, which was this will happen to you guys quite often. This is good a com- good comparison here. They have Jared Cook ranked in this area. They have Vance McDonald ranked in this area. Now, while I like those guys. This is not the area of which I'm trying to take them in the 8th round. They are both guys who are 10, 10th round or later in my book for my rankings. So if we're doing this based off the NBC Fantasy Football Show rankings, we're not looking at a tight end in the 8th round. And being that we've already been solidified at receiver for the most part, this is where we're going to look to kind of stray from the rankings and get what we need. Which would be, we need a running back. So what do we do here for running back? Well... Top on the board and what's on available we have so far would be Rashad Penny. And I like that. Rashad Penny would be our third running back in this scenario. And we know Chris Carson is somebody who is injury prone. We know that the Seattle Seahawks are going to give the ball to the running backs as a unit. Either the most or the second most it's going to be between them and the Baltimore Ravens. So we know that there's going to be plenty of opportunities, even if Chris Carson's on the field, even if Chris Carson's getting 18 to 20 carries. Rashad Penny, who has slimmed down, who is the better pass catcher, who will be utilized as such, will have a significant role. Mike Davis was an RB2 for a long stretch of the season last year just based on the pure volume of touches that he was getting. So we, we're going to take Rashad Penny here and feel good about that as him being our RB3 with a team that's heavily loaded at wide receiver and with a elite top five quarterback already in place. We come back around to the ninth round. We're still going to look for running back depth. We're going to still wait. Jared Cook, Vance McDonald, by the way, are both on the board. Now, if one of them's on the board, come back in the 10th round, that's probably where we'll go. But being that this is the ninth round, and we could still use another running back depth player, another guy who could possibly have the potential to be maybe a lower end RB2 or higher end flex play here, just to make sure we are solidified in the depth position. So we look at running backs. What do we have here? We have guys like Jordan Howard, who I like for the earlier on part of the season, but not for the entire season. I don't have him ranked here in this spot. We have Peyton Barber, who I do have ranked around here, but <sighs> Peyton Barber is one of those guys where just because he is going to be the starter and somebody has to touch the ball as a running back. And I do have him ranked here, like I said. But he's one of those guys that just puts me to sleep. This is where my heart will tug at me. And it's okay to let your heart tug at you when you're talking about the ninth and the 10th round. You're talking about what your death position. Let what The beauty of fantasy football is rooting, wanting to root for your team. And part of that is taking players that you like that maybe aren't necessarily the most calculated, valuable in each position, but players that you want to get behind. And these are the rounds where it's kind of okay to do that. So for me, my calculations would tell me to take Peyton Barber here, but my heart is telling me to take Adrian Peterson here. And a lot of reasons as to why. I know Darius Geis finally came back. I know he got a good amount of carries in that third week of the preseason game. I don't think he looked particularly great. A lot of people want to say relative to, that's fine. Relative to, he wasn't that productive, period. Relative to, I don't think he's going to be that productive during the season. AP is going to be a factor. But actually, now that I look at this, there's actually another option that I just missed. And we're going to go a different direction here. We're going to go Deion Lewis. 
We're going to go Deion Lewis here in the run ninth round, especially because this is the half point PPR league. I had just overlooked him. I, my, my thumb was blocking his name, actually. So we're going to go Deion Lewis here because, as I've mentioned in the past, I don't think Derrick Henry is as good as everyone's making him out to be. I don't think he's going to be as productive as people are trying to make him to be. He had this opportunity last year. Yes, he had a great run towards the end of the season, but remember, going into last season, Derrick Henry was supposed to be the main ball carrier with Deion Lewis taking the pass, passing down work. That part, as far as their roles go, has not changed. Taylor Lewan is going to be suspended for the first four games. That's not a good thing for Derrick Henry. He needs that offensive line to be in tip-top shape, and they're going to be missing their best player in an offensive line that's only so-so without him. So Derrick Henry, I think, is going to have some struggles. I don't think he has great vision as, as a runner. And he's still not the best pass catcher. Deion Lowe is the best pass catcher on that team by a landslide. This is a team that's going to look to screen and use the and flare outs and check downs, whether, whether it's Mariota or Ryan Tannehill. And it's going to be Mariota to start the season, but even as the season wears on. Deion Lowe is a decent runner between the tackles, even for being for a small guy. He's still going to have a significant role. And being as a half-point PPR, I like Deion Lewis as our RB4 in this scenario. So as we move on here, we go to round 10. We have guys flying off the board. Now at round 10, now we're back in a balanced situation. We could go tight end, take our starting tight end here if we want to. We can go back to looking at wide receivers, go back to, and, and keep sticking with the running backs if we so want to. Remember, we have four receivers and four running backs now. Now we're, we're pretty well balanced. We have pieces we can utilize. Now, now we're in a position where it's either we take a starting tight end or we just go for best value. In this scenario, it's one of the few times where it lines up that the tight end is the best value, which is great. Because Vance McDonald is still here in the 10th round. And that's where I have Vance McDonald ranked. I love him in this spot. Look, I think he's a guy who will be a top 10 tight end at the end of the season. I think he's going to have a significant role, especially when we're talking about the red zone for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I just don't want to take him too high. I'm big on not taking tight ends too high. Because tight ends, once you get outside the top 6, top 7 maybe, you pretty much get put in the same territory as a defense, as a kicker. It's luck. It's, it's, it's roulette. Does the ball land on that guy for that day to score a touchdown? Now, Vance McDonald, I think, is a notch better than those guys, which is why I have him in round 10, but just a notch better, which is why I don't have him in round 8 or 9 like he had been. He had been ranked at the top for the last few rounds, and he hasn't gone. So he's here in round 10. We're going to go ahead and take Vance McDonald. Now I have what I believe is a top 10 tight end starting, and I only spent a 10th round pick on him. Didn't have to give up much value for him. And now I'm solidified. I have elite wide receivers. I have good running backs. I have an elite quarterback. I have a top 10 tight end. I have a very well-balanced team at this point. And these are all basing it off of the boat, the best value from the MD's Fantasy Football Show rankings. So now we come back around 11. We could do whatever we want here. We could take simply the best value, the player with the most upside in this position, regardless of what position that they play in. So I'm looking down the list. A lot of tight ends are here. Now, I, I very rarely see this many tight ends, but we have Jared Cook, David Njoku, Austin Hooper, Delaney Walker. We're not going to take a second tight end back-to-back here. I'm a big believer, and once you have a tight end that you believe is a top 10 tight end, there's really no reason to waste another roster spot because if you have to get another tight end because of injury or for bye weeks, you're going to be in the same boat as everybody else. We're going to be picking up a guy that you're hoping to score a touchdown pretty much after that point. So get a guy that you think has a possibility of being in the top 10 tight end and just stick with them until you go back to streaming if you have to, because then you're in the same boat as everybody else anyway. So don't waste the roster spot in the draft. Stock as many guys as you can get that might have value for you later on. My top ranked player here on the board at this point that we're looking at would be Devontae Parker. Yep, Devontae Parker. I'm, I'm going to keep harping on him. He's one of my biggest sleepers. Kenny Stills actually is looking to either be cut or traded at this point. So even Kenny Stills is on his way out. That's just more targets heading Devontae Parker's way. It's going to be Albert Wilson. Looks like it will be Jakeem Grant, especially if Kenny Stills does get cut. Those will be the like, slot, the deep threats. But the featured guy, the number one wide receiver, hands down, head and shoulders, becomes Devontae Parker. And it just, strengthens, it just strengthens my case that I already had made 
for him even before Kenny Stills was possibly going to be off the team. I like Devontae Parker a lot this season. I have him playing 13 games. I don't have him playing a full 16-game season, but in this scenario, he's going to be our wide receiver five with a ton of upside as the number one wide receiver on his team. So we are going to go with Parker in this scenario. And now we can come back again in the 11th round and again take whoever we want. So I'm waiting, waiting. First defenses have come off the board. It's round 12. It's still a little too early for us. Remember, this is the MD's Fantasy Football Show. We're MD Nation. We're smarter than that. We're not going to take a defense in the 12th round. There's no point. Not even for an elite one. If anybody proved that there's no point in taking an elite defense at this point, it is the Jacksonville Jaguars. They proved that last year. They were a defense that a lot of people wanted to take so early because they were such a dominant defense, such a fantasy favorite that everybody wanted to have a piece of them because that's how great they were for the entire season the year before. And then they showed you why you don't take defenses that early, why defenses are so hit or miss in those scenarios. So now we come back here. We have five receivers. We have four running backs. We have our quarterback. We have our tight end. We still have another three rounds here where we can do whatever we want. Another three rounds of taking the best value in this scenario. Now, I want to take a gander at the running back position, and I want to see if I can get somebody who may pan out for me at some point during the season and be a really valuable asset. And that player here is going to be Chris Thompson. Kind of similar to Deion Lewis. Look, half-point PPR, we're taking guys who are going to be serviceable. Chris Thompson, Deion Lewis, they're going to have flex appeal because of the half-point PPR scoring because they're going to be involved. Chris Thompson's probably the only running back that I feel good about drafting when it comes to the Washington Redskins because he's the only one that I trust what his role is going to be every single week because every single week I know he's going to catch the ball. He's going to be brought in in two-minute drills. And I expect the Redskins to be in a lot of third and longs this year because I don't expect them to have a good offense. That offensive line is going to be terrible. Case Keenum's an awful quarterback. They don't have great receivers. There's a really good chance that Chris Thompson and when he's on the field, Jordan Reed are going to have to lead the way as far as the receiving core goes, as far as the pass catchers go. So I'm taking Chris Thompson here with a high floor and possibly higher than expected ceiling just because of the opportunity and the way it sets up. And now I'm feeling even better and better about my team. We're having some great depth here so far. Great depth here so far. Now we're looking through here. Coming back, 13th round. There's a, there's a lot of guys we could go with here. A lot of guys. The tight ends are still all sitting there pretty. That's the crazy thing. There's a lot of tight ends still on the board here. Eric Ebron's still on the board. That could be a byproduct of Andrew Luck being gone now. Jordan Reed's still on the board who I like. Mark Andrews, my number one sleeping tight end, still on the board. Uh, we're not, again, we're not going to take a tight end, but I want I want you guys to have an idea in some of these drafts where some of these tight ends may just sit there. Mark Andrews will be there in the 13th round for you in most of your drafts, without a doubt. Running backs, wide receivers. We're looking at the handcuff in the running back range at this point. Wide receivers, we're looking at guys, we're just looking for pure upside at this point. So we look at the MD Fanny Football Show rankings. What do we have on the board? What are we looking at? Well, believe it or not, and I'm I'm pausing because I'm trying to make sure that this is right before I go ahead and, and put this out there. Believe it or not, this may not be a bad place to consider a guy like a Kareem Hunt. I'm not going to take Kareem Hunt here because I've been hell-bent on not taking him. But on a team this deep... In this scenario, it wouldn't be out of the question if you wanted to see if what if Nick Chubb gets hurt? What if Kareem Hunt does have a significant role and come to playoff time? Though those scenarios, he could have some value. Now I'm 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 certain that whatever team takes him in your league will wind up dropping him because they're probably not gonna have the amount of depth that we have at this point. And that's the only reason why you would even consider him here quite frankly but with us trying to keep in line with taking guys that have value for us all year long we're gonna go with another receiver here because the next highest guy ranked would be Mohamed Sanu 
Now, this isn't a flashy one. This is all floor. But in a half-point PPR on a very good offense, Mohamed Sanu is still going to have value as a wide receiver, as a high-end wide receiver 5, wide receiver 4. A guy who can come in and be a spot starter for you in a pinch on an injury or in a bye week. He has that ability. And now we're just loading up on depth. He's a guy with value. So we're going to take Mohamed Sanu here in the 13th round. Coming back in the 14th round, now this is where I like to get a little creative. This is where I might take a defense and a kicker in the 14th and 15th round, knowing that I have the 16th round to come back and take whatever the highest flyer left on my board is. Because doing it that way, if you're playing in a home league that is smarter than your average bear and not just going to try to take defense and kickers you know, in the 8th, ninth round just to fill out their starting roster before they work on their bench... If you're in a smarter type of league where they're going to wait on defense and kicker, I don't mind going around earlier than everybody else to try to lock in an elite-ranked defense, an elite-ranked kicker based off of our standings here. So that's what we're going to do because what we can do right now, we can come back in the 14th round, take an elite defense. We can take the Rams, who are the number one ranked defense on the MD's Fantasy Football Show. So now we have an elite defense. We come back in the 15th round, we're going to look at the kicker position. And we take Greg Zerlin. Now, this is actually similar to the standard mock that we did where we wound up with the Rams defense and Greg Zerlin there as well. And a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to wind up with a defense and a kicker on a bye week. I don't want to pick up a defense and kicker both in one week. And what I have to say is that who cares? If you're going to get guys who are in the top five or higher, top three in this scenario, number one overall is where we have them ranked at at their positions, who cares if they're going to have the same bye weeks? You're going to have to deal with that no matter what the position is. They're kickers, they're defenses. If you can get the number one there, that gives you an advantage over everybody else. So we are going to take Greg Zerlin. And if you absolutely must choose between the two, I'd rather have Greg Zerlin than the Rams defense. Because Greg Zerlin is a kicker who gets so many opportunities because it's a high-scoring offense and because he can boot it from anywhere. He gets you a lot of 50-yarders. I mean, there before he was banged up last year, the year before, he was almost as good not almost, actually was as good as a high-end RB2 because of how many opportunities he was getting to just bomb field goals all day long because of the offense, because of the opportunity, because of his leg. RB2 numbers, that's what he put up two years ago. So if you're going to choose between the two, I would say choose Greg Zerlin, but just take them both. Worry about the bye week when you come to it. Chances are you'll be able to get him back. Chances are you might even have guys on the IR injured or have guys that are worth dropping at that point as well anyway. So worry about that when you get to it. Don't worry about that in August. So now we come back in the 16th round, and we can just simply take whoever the hell we want. Whoever we think might have the most upside of all these players. And right now, with what's ranked, what's what's left on the board, we actually are going to go with tight end here. Didn't think we would, but in the 16th round, it doesn't matter. You're taking Mr. Irrelevant. You're taking the guy that you're probably going to wind up dropping first. This is all about taking some kind of upside. And in this scenario with Vance McDonald, if we can have a pretty good tight end, which is what we're looking at right now, to be able to pair with him, be able to rotate with him, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And Kyle Rudolph is just sitting here on the board. Number one ranked tight end here. He's already developed more of a rapport with Kirk Cousins. The Vikings are going to use more two tight end sets this season. They've been having emphasis on getting him involved more in the red zone. So I like having Kyle Rudolph and Vance McDonald to pair up and be able to rotate based off a matchup. So that's what we're going to do there. So now we get the recap. Well, first of all, I guess I'll tell you guys what the grade is. It actually wound up being a B plus. So this is the second draft I've had. I only have good graded drafts when I'm on the air, by the way. When I'm by myself mock drafting, I always seem to get like a, a D minus, a C, uh, you know, never anything lower than that. But on the draft so far on, on air with you guys, maybe it's you guys who make me better, who knows, or at least better in this, you know, app's eyes. I had We had an A on the standard draft last Thursday. Now we're going to have a B plus here very, very strange, very odd. I'm not used to getting these good draft grades. But let's recap. So we wound up, we had the sixth pick. We wound up with Devontae Adams. Then we came back with Tyreek Hill as our wide receiver too. Antonio Brown will be our flex in this league. Came back in the fourth round, we grabbed Mark Ingram to be our RB1, who you know I feel strongly about. Came back in the fifth round and grabbed Aaron Rodgers, who I think will be the number two quarterback overall. 
came back in the sixth round, grabbed Duke Johnson, who suddenly has great value in PPR leagues now. After that, look around, came back with A.J. Green after we had some balance for pure upside at this point and no no risk whatsoever because you already have Devontae Adams, Tyree Kill, and Antonio Brown. Come back with Rashad Penny after that, who we like as an RB3. We like as a backup running back to bring in who has upside and a path to be a number one running back on his team given Carson's injury history. We come back with Deion Lewis, who has a high floor in PPR leagues. We came back from that with Devontae Parker, who is my number one sleeping wide receiver this season. Came back with that and came back with Chris Thompson. Came back after that, got our starting tight end in Vance McDonald, who I like a lot this year. Then we got Muhammad Sanu. Then we got the Rams defense. Then we got Greg Zerlin. And then we got Kyle Rudolph to cap off the draft. This is a team that not only has a great starting lineup with great high-end scoring potential, but also has a great bench. Going to have an answer for every bye week, every injury. You're not going to miss a beat. So this, this is really a great team. And I'm not just saying that because I use my rankings and then I'm the one drafting it. I'm saying that because I want you guys to realize this is the kind of team that you could have. This is a championship caliber type of team by using my rankings. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back with a quick mailbag segment because, once again, we're getting close to time because I always have so much to go over with you guys. But we're coming back with a quick mailbag segment and then wrap up the episode. The MD's Fantasy Football Show is proud to become a new member of Overtime Heroics. Overtime Heroics is a fantastic sports media platform for sports fans all around the world to come and participate in their extensive forums. And now with the merger of the Land Sports Network, the website will soon have great content available from extremely well-written articles to entertaining and informative podcasts from all sports for you to enjoy. All you have to do is register for free at OvertimeHeroics.com to participate. Again, that's OvertimeHeroics.com. So I just grabbed a couple of really good questions here that we can get to pretty quickly so we can get this episode wrapped up and on the way. Uh, First of all, we got Graham, uh, Graham Fan from Twitter. He asked, should I trade Tyler Lockett and carry on Johnson for Joe Mixon in a one-point PPR league? And my answer to that would be no. I would not do that deal. I love Joe Mixon. You guys know this. I just talked about how he's in my top 10. But Carryon Johnson, I don't have too far behind. Carryon Johnson is somebody who could have a similar stat line or at least a comparable stat line to Joe Mixon. And the difference between Joe Mixon and Carryon Johnson is not Tyler Lockett. That's too much value. For instance here, overall... And this is not just running backs. Overall, I have Joe Mixon, the 13th player overall, with Carrion Johnson, the 27th player overall. So pretty much I just have Carrion Johnson around behind Joe Mixon. And I don't I think Tyler Lockett's worth more than one round at the end of the day. And I think that's kind of what you're looking at here. And one point PPR league with Tyler Lockett really lining up to be the number one target again for Seattle. That's a little too much value. So, Graham, no, I would not make that deal. I really love Carryon Johnson this year, especially in a PPR league. He's going to catch the ball now that Theo Riddick is gone. While I love Joe Mixon, as far as a top 10 guy goes, he does have the lowest floor of those guys because of the situation around him, because of the lack of weapons with A.J. Green hurt, because that offensive line could prove to be one of the worst, if not the worst, in the NFL this season. So, no, I am not doing that deal. Our second question that we're going to talk about here is Ellen from Facebook. She asked, out of DJ Moore, Calvin Ridley, Alshon Jeffrey, and Mike Williams, which would you draft? So this is the question I feel like she's talking about the fifth or sixth round. That's where, that's where these tier of wide receivers are going for the most part. Um, and this has been a pretty common question, I think, throughout the entire summer because these four have been pretty much lumped together next to each other all summer long and haven't really moved up or down too much as a result, which is also very kind of interesting, especially given this time of year, how many guys are moving around. And they've all been kind of lumped together. Now, she doesn't say whether it's a half point or a full point PPR. Now, luckily with these type of receivers, uh, whether it's a standard half point or a one point PPR league, it's not going to matter too much. All of these guys are pretty similar as to what their roles are, 
what their expected outcome production is. That no one's like no one's one guy who's expected to get a lot of catches but not a lot of touchdowns. The, all four of these guys are people who are expected to be balanced as far as targets and getting into the red zone as far as all of that goes. I would say that I who I have ranked the highest in this scenario is Alshon Jeffrey. Now, the reason I have Alshon Jeffrey ahead of Calvin Ridley and Mike Williams, more specifically, because if you've been listening to this show, you know I'm not high on DJ Moore. While everyone else seems to have him ranked in this group, I have him ranked closer to guys like Tyrell Williams back in the 10th round. I don't think he's somebody you want to take as your wide receiver two. I think he's actually a more of a high-end wide receiver four than he is a wide receiver two or wide receiver three. So DJ Moore automatically would be out for me in this scenario. Alshon Jeffrey, I have him higher than Calvin Ridley and Mike Williams. One, because there is a real chance that he's the number one wide receiver for his team, unlike Calvin Ridley and Mike Williams, who are destined to be the number two guys on their respective teams. But also because I expect Alshon Jeffrey to have a much improved season as far as the stat line goes this year, due to the fact that they have guys like Deshaun Jackson, Carson Wentz is back. I expect that running game to be good, regardless of who it is that's back there. You're still going to have Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard, but all of those guys, Deshaun Jackson is the one that really actually boosts all Sean Jeffrey. Now you would think, hey, another wide receiver coming in, usually that's just guy who takes away targets that would harm him. No, in this scenario, it boosts him because it allows all Sean Jeffrey to do what he does best. Deshaun Jackson can take the top off. Deshaun Jackson's going to demand the attention of that safety playing over the top. No longer is Jeffrey going to be looking at cloud-type coverage, which is what's been killing him because he's never been a guy who's going to get big separation. He's never been a guy who's going to beat your corner consistently down the field. He is a guy, however, when he gets one-on-ones, is going to win that 50-50 ball. That's who he is. He wants to be that big body receiver. Throw it to him in tight coverage, he's going to make the catch. That's how he functions. He's a glorified Anquan Baldwin. Bald, uh, Baldwin. Excuse me. At the end of his career. But you know, better, obviously, more explosive than what Anquan Bolden became at the end of his career. But that's the type of guy he wants to be. He's going to be effective in the red zone. And when you have a guy who can take the top off on the other side... That's what helps open up those types of guys to get more of those one-on-ones, more of those 50-50 balls. I like Alshon Jeffrey a lot this year to take a step up. I like Mike Williams and Calvin Ridley too, and I don't think you can really go wrong at the end of the day between the three. But from this show's perspective, Alshon Jeffrey is ranked just a bit ahead of those other guys for those reasons that I've mentioned. That's going to wrap up the show today. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. One more show now. It's only one more show now before we get into the week one previews the following week. We will be back on Thursday. We're going to examine some wide, more wide receiver rankings that we didn't get to talk about so far. We're going to come back. We're going to do another live mock draft. It's going to be a one-point PPR from the ninth position. And then we're going to come back with another mailbag segment on Thursday. So make sure you get your questions in. Make sure you're listening along on your favorite podcast app. Make sure you're following me along at Twitter at MDSFF Show on Facebook at MDFF Show. And of course, going to the website, keeping up to date with the projections and the rankings and all the episodes and the news coming out. We also have articles coming out to you guys soon. I promise you articles will be coming out. My brother, Chris Dowhower, the first writer of the MD's Fantasy Football Show, is going to be producing articles very soon. So you have that to look forward to during the season as well. We are nonstop working for you to be the best fantasy football podcast we can be so that way you can win. I hope to see you guys all on Thursday and have a lovely day. Thank you for listening to the MD's Fantasy Football Show.